Thank you for joining us for the March Gate Equity Webinar, where we explore topics related to equity and graduation success. This webinar will be recorded, and at long last, our webinars are now available with captions. Thank you, Laura Moore, for helping us make this so much more accessible. Um, today's PowerPoint is posted on the OSPI website on the Gate Equity Webinar page under the Archive section. So if you want to follow along, that's where it is. Um, also, we'd like to ask that you direct the questions you want us to answer in the Q&A and not the chat, so we can make sure that we answer them. I'm Kathy Anderson, OSPI Graduation Equity Program Supervisor, and today's topic is Equity with AP Plus Civics. Um, this webinar was originally scheduled to the exact same time as the National Student Walkout Against Gun Violence. And this being a fairly civic-minded group, naturally, none of our presenters could make it. <laughs> so we're really lucky that they're here with us today. We have this, um, we have the Civics Dream Team. We have Walter Parker. He is a, professional, or a professor of social studies education at the University of Washington. And he's done some extraordinary work preparing new teachers to engage students through civics education. And today's presenters are a panel of Walter's former students. So he's handpicked to talk about what their work looks like in real schools. We also have with us Katie Piper, an instructional coach in Bellevue High School. Uh, Jerry uh, her Neufeld Kaiser, a social studies teacher at Garfield High School. And Robert Halleck, social studies teacher at Sammamish High School. Welcome to our program. We're so glad you could be here with us today. Um, before we begin, it's important to ground our work in OSPI's K-12 education vision. It has three phases, each lasting two years, from small improvements to a full redesign of the K-12 education system. We believe the goal of our education system is to pre prepare all students for post-secondary aspirations, careers, and life. Recently, the legislature passed a bill that makes civics education a required class for graduation. We're hoping this webinar will be a resource as schools start to prepare for the implementation of those classes. Our goals for today are to get you familiar with the six proven practices and some strong examples um, from project-based learning ideas, as well as to get you some practical advice on some of the finer points of doing these in the classroom. Our presenters have a lot of great information, so I'm going to hand it off to Walter first. Welcome, Walter. All right, thanks, Kefi, and welcome, everybody. And I'm especially happy about presenting with uh, three local high school teachers who I know well, and Indeed, while they were my former students, they are entirely independent and autonomous beings now. <laughs> so fear not any undue influence by me over them. Rather, it goes the opposite way. All right. Um, I think the first slide is important because it's important that we grasp that there is now somewhat of a national consensus over what high quality civic education looks like in school. And you're looking at the six proven practices that were developed by a consensus panel. You can Google that panel. It's called Guardian of Democracy, the Civic Mission of the Schools, and read more about it. But you'll notice there's six items. Take a minute to scan them. And I've put three stars on the chart. And these stars reference the th the proven practices that we have deliberately built into our AP government approach. Uh, first of all, there is, of course, as you might expect, direct instruction on history and structures of US government. Uh, educational researchers haven't discovered a whole lot, but certainly we've discovered that kids stand a much greater chance of learning something if it's taught than if it's not. So I mean that only partially tongue in cheek, it is true. So kids, if we want kids to understand the history and structures of US democracy, then we need to teach that. And that's what number one deals with. Number two is discussion practice through all sorts of discussion structures, seminar debates, deliberations, SACS stands for Structured Academic Controversy. SACS are built right into our approach. 
repetitively. And finally, simulations. Our approach really features simulations. It's a kind of project-based learning, but every one of the projects is a simulation, which many social studies teachers are already quite familiar with, which is why our approach is not so terribly different from business as usual. Uh, so let me comment further on that. Kefi, if you'd advance the slide to the poster. So this is a one-page representation of our approach. We call it knowledge in action. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see the AP topics. So one of the reasons why we work with the AP version of the government course is because it's very difficult to innovate uh, on the AP platform. So whenever you want to test a new model, you should test it under the most difficult circumstances. And indeed, that's what we're doing by testing this simulations approach to US government by doing it in the AP Gov course, because goal number one for us is that our students do as well or better on the AP test as students in traditional AP Gov classrooms. And uh, I'll show you a slide about the results later. But we always keep the AP topics uppermost in mind that you see on the upper left of the poster. And the bottom right of the poster are the five projects or challenges. Uh, and the next slide will make that bigger for you. So let me focus on the middle now. The, uh, we say that projects are the spine of the course. That's kind of our slogan, meaning that uh, projects do all the heavy lifting of the course. The And you'll, every project is a simulation. Um, you'll notice across the top of the spine is the master course question. Um, what is the proper role of government in a democracy? Uh, our teachers, including uh, Katie and Jerry, who you'll be hearing from, um, developed this question. We revised it in year two or three, and we came back to it the following year because it seems to work best. You'll notice it's an open question. You'll notice that it's a question that is very authentic because the American public is in sharp disagreement right now about the proper role of government in a democracy. So it's a genuine question. We explore it in the first project and keep exploring it in every project. The idea is that students' responses to it should develop gradually through the course, becoming ever more informed, ever more complex. Let's look into these projects a little more closely. Walter, can I interject really quickly? Sorry, of course. Be before we move on to, to looking at those projects more deeply, I was just going to say for any participants who are uh, familiar with the AP government course, you may know that it's being revised for next year. So the six topics that are listed here are the current course framework, but they're going to change next year. Um, we have looked carefully at how these simulations uh, kind of stack up to um, the revised curriculum outline and we think they still work really well. And in fact, we think it's gonna serve students particularly well for the goal of that revision, which was to um, have concepts loop more and have students go deeper uh, onto some of those abstract concepts. So I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, the important, thanks Katie. And let me, while we're still looking at the poster, uh, mentioned that the uh, interesting thing about simulations is that they're a form of experiential learning. So students take the roles of various political agents. They're taking the roles of delegates, candidates, Supreme Court justices, Supreme Court attorneys, legislators, agency heads, interest group members, and so on. So while they're pretending they're also in a kind of a really interesting way ex actually experiencing those roles as one of our students said it's like job shadowing you get to experience what it's actually like so kefi advanced to the project slide if you would so here here are the five and they're in order so at the beginning of the year is founders intent and in that project that lasts approximately three weeks. Students are delegates to the Constitutional Convention of 1787, deciding on the structure of the new government, and then taking the result back to their states for the ratification um, conventions. That's where the debates really 
got off the ground. Uh, in the second project is mock elections. I, I think probably many of social studies teachers across the country are already doing mock elections of one sort or another. A number of different nonprofits sponsor mock elections, so it's not that unusual. In ours, students are candidates, voters, journalists, campaign managers, finance managers, leaders of interest groups pressuring the candidates, political parties, and so on. Of course, the goal is to win the election. Uh, the elected president then gets to appoint Supreme Court justices. So we move to the Supreme Court uh, and a very common social studies simulation, which is moot courts, where students take roles as attorneys and judges in appellate courts and then justices in the Supreme Court. So we rotate students through moot courts of from the circuits and then into um, the National Supreme Court. Um, next project is a mock Congress. Again, this is not too unusual because a lot of teachers are already doing mock Congresses and perhaps using the simulation called Ledge Sim developed by my colleague here at UW, John Wilkerson. At any rate, students are legislators drafting bills and seeing how politics influence public policy. They're in committees and floor debates and so on. And the final project is a bit more unusual, uh, government in action. This, in this one, students are consultants to interest groups. Uh, so they might find themselves assigned to Planned Parenthood or the NRA or the AFL-CIO or an immigration interest group or a healthcare interest group or whatever. And in that role, they have to give smart political advice to the interest group to help them advance their um, program, their agenda through the through through the policy arena into into law or into policy effect. So let's advance the slide now, and I'll get to results and then very quickly turn it over to Jerry and Katie. So I just wanted to show you at least one slide about results. Remember, our goal is that our students do as well or better as students in traditional classrooms. And generally, that is the case. If you look at the chart, uh, two of our school districts that are here referred to as Urban 1 and Urban 2, they're in different states. Um, and they are urban schools. Therefore, they have a high poverty rate measured by free and reduced lunch. So Urban 1 had an Percentage, 57% students were eligible for FRL. Urban 2, 72% were eligible. So for our control groups, our comparison groups, we compared our students to the National College Board data for the same FRL clusters. So Urban 1 is compared to down in row 3, the national cluster 50 to 100. And if you go to the final column, you'll see that we our pass rates were better, uh, as were our average scores, slightly better. And the pass rate, 30% compared to 21%. And then in the case of Urban 2, where the poverty rate increased, we compare it to that national cluster, 70 100%. And you can see that our students did a little better on the average scores, but uh, only a tiny bit better, insignificant, and had the same pass rates. So the what's sort of remarkable about it is that when we speak to AP teachers at the national conference, for example, the first thing they want to know is, well, what are the pass rates? Because I, I too could change my pedagogy, but I'd be afraid of lowered pass rates. And we're able to assure them that it's worth it's worth the try, worth the effort, because generally speaking, we're getting same or better pass rates. So the next slide, if you please, and I'll conclude with it. What about equity? So we know from lots of different research sources, uh, this source down in the bottom right is Joe Kahn's work out of California, but we know from lots of sources that high quality civic education as measured by those six 
proven practices that I discussed at slide one, we know that it's not equitably distributed in the US, that in fact the correlates are social class, race, and future plans. So higher socioeconomic students uh, are more likely to get high quality civic education. White students are more likely than students of color to get high quality civic education. And students who consider themselves college bound are more likely to get high quality civic education, probably because they track themselves into courses that are known for higher quality civic education. And with that, let me turn the podium to Katie and Jerry. Thank you. Um, are we gonna do something with questions and polling now? Nope. Yeah, we can. We are going to do some questions and polling. So um, for our audience, we're wondering, um, do you use project-based learning to engage students consistently sometimes or not yet? So um, we're going to have you weigh in on the poll. Um, at the moment, we don't have any questions out in the audience or anything in the chat. But if people do have questions, now would be a great time to ask them of Walter and um, of other people, too. So, anybody out there seeing the votes? Okay, I'm going to share our results here. And you can see that there's a difference between consistently and not yet and um, sometimes there, okay? Yep. Sometimes is great. I just want mm -hmm. to add that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Agreed. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. All right. So to uh, expand a bit on what Walter was uh, speaking about in terms of the AP Plus uh, project and framework, um, here are some of the strengths of project-based learning that Jerry and I um, talked about in our, uh, our social education article. Uh, so first of all, giving students the opportunity to do authentic, relevant work. Um, Walter spoke to this a little bit with the idea of it's almost as if we're job shadowing, uh, right? So they, students get the chance to do the work of people in the political science discipline or in related fields, um, such as the law. And Walter mentioned the fact that uh, many government students or AP, or I'm sorry, teachers, or AP government teachers will sometimes do projects like a moot court or like a mock Congress. Um, but what I found in working with teachers and doing workshops for AP teachers particularly is that often they're doing um, what we have sometimes called dessert projects. This was a metaphor that Walter helped us with early on in our understanding of project-based learning. And my hope is that the knowledge and action project has allowed teachers access to taking a con some concepts that they're familiar with and sort of beefing them up a little bit so that the projects really serve as the main course that drives the learning. And so for the example that Jerry and I wrote about in our article, which was focusing on Supreme Court cases, um, students learn in a more genuine way what appellate court looks like, what are the, what's the work that justices and appellate attorneys do, what does legal writing uh, look like, and how do you authentically make your argument in that particular framework? Another strength that we found is that the projects give us an opportunity to frame important, enduring civic questions that we think all students who are living in this country should be grappling with. Walter mentioned the course question, course master question, uh, what's the proper rule of government? But uh, a unit level example that Jerry and I might pose to our students would be, what should be the limits of free speech? Or how do we uh, weigh the needs of society against the rights of the individual? We want all students to grapple with that. And students don't come with the same experiences to the course in the beginning. So to think about that equity goal, uh, if, if students have simulations to draw upon in forming their thoughts and opinions on questions like that, they're gonna have more to say and they're gonna be able to engage in a conversation with other students who might have come into the course feeling more confident, who might have already spoken about politics more, more extensively at home. Um, and finally, we found that this, this 
uh, mode of teaching provides an opportunity for more deep content understanding. When I first taught the course, and I would look at uh, lists of anywhere from 40 to 60 cases that students needed to be able to know, sort of buzzword know for the exam. I tried to cover them all. And so I would uh, divide and conquer up between groups. They were gonna do a number of PowerPoints on a number of different cases. And so we wound up sitting through a lot of really awful PowerPoints. I'm not really sure many people learned much from it, but I thought, well, at least I covered it. Uh, but when we started to do these moot court simulations, what I found is that students knew fewer cases better and that that actually positively impacted their scores. On the revised exam, students are only required to know by name a, a smaller set of cases, but they also need to be able to apply the concepts of those must-know cases, there's 15 now, uh, to unknown cases. And so we think students who have been through these moot court simulations are going to be particularly well suited to be able to do that skill and demonstrate that skill on the exam. Hey, Katie, I'd like to comment on the yeah, please. authentic relevant work. This is Jerry. Um, you know, I think maybe the, the, the single most sort of central skill in social studies uh, classes is argument uh, building or argument writing or argument construction, or thesis plus evidence. And um, whereas a typical AP government class might put the students in the position of t note taking and memorizing and reading, what, what happens with the simulations is the students get put in the position of having to build an argument in lots of different settings. And that's everything from issuing a ruling as a Supreme Court justice that says that here's the winner and here's why, to uh, issuing an endorsement as an interest group member in a mock election that similarly is, here's our candidate of choice and here's why. And over and over you see these opportunities that fit quite naturally into the simulation activities to push that skill of building an argument, which is, you know, I think really a strength of the approach. I would agree. Get a lot of practice with that. Thanks. And we can move on to the next slide. So just to expand a little bit more on PBL as a more equitable teaching practice, um, I mentioned this a little bit on the last slide, but I believe these fit simulations provide access to students who come into the class really maybe not knowing anything about what's a Democrat, what's a Republican, not feeling confident in their views because they haven't had a lot of chance to really explore them. Um, and here they have the chance to draw off of experiences that the whole class participated in, um, in order to be able to really develop and refine their thinking. Um, and this especially will happen with something like moot court simulations if you select cases that will resonate with your student population. Students really enjoy uh, cases on student speech or search and seizure, um, on uh, civil rights. And within the framework of what the AP exam wants students to focus on, there's a lot of opportunity to focus on cases that will also be meaningful for uh, students. Anything else you'd want to say on that, Jerry? No, thanks. All right, I'm going to turn it over to you then to talk a little more about the, the student experience. Thanks. Um, yeah, so what I want to comment on here is sort of what's it like to be a student in this class as opposed to the note-taking all day and memorizing uh, experience that happens when you sit in desks in rows in the sort of old school approach. So in the simulation approach, um, the first uh, key thing is that it's really student-driven. When we're prepping uh, for a hearing or for a debate or something, I'm coaching uh, the kids, but they're really doing the work. Um, that's similarly true when we're preparing for a congressional floor session. Um, on the performance days, my role is largely to sit in the back corner and watch the students do their thing. Um, this makes it fun for the students. They're front and center, their personality shows. They get to enjoy seeing each other portray a congressperson or a Supreme Court judge or a um, bleeding heart liberal in a mock forum on immigration or whatever. Uh, it dials up the pressure a bit. Um, uh, the others are watching you, so you really have to know your stuff. Um, it turns out that there's advantages to the teacher too, because I can see pretty clearly how strongly students have understood the material by watching them enact their roles. Um, you know, when you, when you have to argue before the Supreme Court and handle the questions that they interrupt you with, it turns out you learn the precedents much more strongly 
than if you had heard them described by a teacher and written them down. Um, we hear the students tell us this over and over. It's really a strength of the approach. Um, here's a good example of that. A couple of years ago, there was an AP test question that said, um, name two advantages that the majority party has in Congress besides the fact that they have more people. And what happens with our students, they told me this when they came back from the test, is they pictured the simulation we did and the students in the who played Democrats in the minority party recalled very clearly the frustration they felt when their Republican party chair deprioritized their bills and gave them minimal amount of time and when the Speaker of the House never got around to their, to their liberal uh, Democrat bills because the Speaker was advancing their own conservative agenda. And it turns out that the students knew exactly uh, two advantages that the majority party had. And not because they were trying to recall from memorized notes, but because they had gone through it. It's the experiential uh, part of the class that Walter mentioned earlier. The, the kids who are running for president want to win. They want to beat their friends. Um, that scheming gets them into it more. It's much more engaging for them. They put time and energy into the class uh, much more than they would. I would just add on to some of what Jerry's saying there uh, in terms of what he's describing through the election project and the legislative simulation that I always say to people it feels as far removed as it could from sort of the game of school. Um, and I think of the game of school as where the teacher is just trying to squeeze more work and recognition out of students, but is still doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, here, that's, that's less necessary because uh, students are engaged, they're having fun, and, and uh, teachers are, are in a role on the side as facilitators, really trying to uh, maximize the impact of, of the work that they're doing. And the students um, bring that out in each other um, when, you know, if we're having a mock public forum on immigration, for example, and if somebody shows up in camo and dark glasses uh, and decides to speak with an accent, it like brings the whole class to life. Um, or if somebody volunteers to open the congressional floor session with a prayer that they wrote, it makes the whole class um, more fun and that one person's enthusiasm enriches everyone's experience. Kay, did you wanna comment on this more? I think what I, what I just said is it was uh, pretty much captured. Yeah, but I wanted to say that, move on. Okay. And so the last um, comments I wanna make are about, uh, I guess, tips for teachers um, using this approach. Um, the first is that our role is coach more than lecturer. We're still experts and the students still need that from us. Um, one of the ways that we can help them is by setting time in the schedule for helping them um, not just learn the content, but play the role, play that part. So for example, we listen to some oral argument from a real Supreme Court case to hear how the justices interrupt and question the lawyers so that they know how to play that part. Um, or we look at images, um, uh, photographs from, taken from public forums of all different sorts so that they can picture what they'll be simulating. And that helps them know how to do it, know how to get into it. Um, playing up the drama like this helps bring the whole thing to life. So, you know, another tip is uh, like get choir robes from the music teacher for the Supreme Court justices or get a barrister's wig for the judge in your mock trial or have the kids dress up for their UN hearing or for their congressional uh, session or whatever that is. Um, Jerry, can I make a comment there? The, uh, if you uh, go to Edutopia and Google knowledge in action, you'll see a short film uh, and the, uh, you'll see students, uh, the, I remember in the film are students in Jerry's class Jerry evidently has a collection of neckties that could uh, costume the entire school. Uh, so you see the the attorneys are wearing neckties. Um, and it's just, just I'm speaking to playing up the drama that part of making role playing successful is that the teacher becomes something of a drama coach and helps students get into their roles. That's yeah. all. You know, there's a different kind of coach that you can involve, and that's people from the real world who have expertise on this. Just last week, I had a law professor come in and coach up my lawyer teams on their affirmative action court cases. 
that was the day before we had our mock hearing. She brings a rigor to that that I can't, and she has background knowledge. Turns out she was clerking for Justice Ginsburg for two of the precedents we were using. Um, and just that, that whole thing, that experience of working with her dialed up the um, enthusiasm and the rigor uh, and the expectations. It was delightful for me to get to see that. Um, the kids raved afterwards about how she pushed them, but it was fun and helpful. Um, you know, you could bring in the libertarian candidate from your local legislature's race and have them talk about the third party candidate experience. Um, you could have the city's budget director come in and talk about budget cuts uh, and the trade-offs that get made for services and taxes and um, that sort of thing. And all, all of these experts can put a face on what you're simulating. And it turns out that the kids report that it, these experts end up reinforcing the stuff that we claim happens in our simulations. Yeah, I would agree with all that. I've used uh, a number, a wide range of different experts. I've used parent attorneys, I've used graduate students, I've used a lot of the different examples Jerry just mentioned. And sad as it makes me to say, in some ways, uh, students really hang on on their words of advice more than they do on mine. <laughs> so um, that, that makes for, um, again, a, a more authentic and engaging and, uh, and real simulation for, for students. Yeah. So I think we're going to turn it over to Rob is going to talk about what this might look like in a different social studies discipline. Is that right? Walter, did you want to introduce yeah. him? Yeah, we're, uh, Rob teaches in the same school as Katie over in Bellevue, Sammamish High School. And when Katie and her colleagues there were cranking up this approach to AP government, this knowledge and action approach, uh, Rob began creating a using more or less the same model to uh, create AP world history along the same lines. So, uh, Rob, take it away. Sure. Uh, Kathy, yeah, just before uh, we get started, Rob, I hate to cut you off. I'm sorry, that was awkward timing. Um, the bells that you were hearing in the background on my end mean that I have to run to my class. So, I'm going to have to excuse myself. Um, sorry to have to leave early, and thanks for including me, everybody. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Jerry. So, um, as Walter said uh, at Sammamish, after seeing what Katie uh, Piper did and, and what they were doing with uh, Knowledge in Action, we uh, worked on a colleague and, and, and I, uh, Katie Smoot, um, developed uh, a, a PBL curriculum for uh, AP World History. Uh, which I also think we also use a lot of it for our world history as well. And I want to just uh, talk a little bit about um, one of the units. Uh, and this is the unit that we write about in our, in the social education article. Um, and so it's called the diplomacy challenge. And this, this unit is set in the early modern era, 1450 to 1750. And uh, this is a time of, uh, uh, European uh, exploration. This is a time of uh, expansion of empires. Um, and we grappled with the question, what, what's a, what is a good authentic question to think about? Um, and we came up with the question, uh, how do empires use diplomacy to maintain and expand their power? So just as with APGov, there's that, that core question uh, that doesn't have one answer. Uh, same thing here. How do empires use diplomacy to maintain and expand their power? Um, in the past, we would have lectured out, uh, you know, 10, 12 empires. If it's Monday, it must be the Ottoman Empire. Um, however, uh, what we did instead with this is we assigned uh, teams of students in a class um, a specific empire or kingdom to uh, uh, and we gave them the roles of being diplomats from that empire. So their mission as diplomats was to help their empire maintain and expand their power. And, you know, as Jerry mentioned, kids want to win. Kids want to negotiate and scheme and get the best deal. So uh, that provided, they, uh, representing an individual empire, they began to think, okay, how can I get the best of my these other empires. 
So we broke down this uh, unit into three uh, parts. So we thought about what is it that the diplomats do? Well, one thing they do is gather intelligence. So we, we, uh, the first part of our, uh, the project would be to uh, present an intelligence briefing to other students about their empire. What was important for other students to know? And what would have possibly been, and, and Katie alluded to this with this, Supreme Court cases, uh, potentially death by PowerPoint ends up with uh, each empire presenting the most important things they think other empires should know if their goal is to negotiate with them. So the, the PowerPoints are really a form of gathering intelligence. And after each, each presentation, uh, students are asked, okay, do you want to negotiate with this empire or not? And they turn and talk and you can, from the energy around what they're doing, you can tell, okay, look, here's what they, that they're paying attention. Here's what they said. Uh, yes, we're interested. Or no, these people are, are adversaries. So we start with an intelligence briefing. Based on that, we, uh, students have to select uh, a, 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 an empire that they want to invite to a diplomatic reception and toast, right? Because we know that the diplomats, one of the things they do is is uh, socialize and gather uh, frequently. So we have them set up a diplomatic reception and that the heart of that is a toast. And again, echoing what uh, Katie and Jerry said, we have them, drama is key. So we have them dress up, we have them bring food from their, that represents their empire. Uh, we use uh, bubbly, non-alcoholic drinks and have kids give toasts. And they do, they toast their other, toast another empire uh, in, in an effort to woo that empire. And then finally, where the rubber hits the road is, is they have to end up negotiating a treaty. So that's the third component of this challenge. So they will negotiate a, a, a treaty in their best interest. They may work with one or two different empires and um, that's their culminating piece. And they have to use the historic context and use the intelligence that they were provided to justify their decisions. Um, so this is a, a four to six weeks, uh, which is about the time a normal unit in AP world, about the amount of time you have for that. And it covers a broad amount of territory. Um, Kefi, if you can move to the next slide. So one of the things that, uh, we have we wrote about in our article is the idea of a secret ingredients of PBL um, and some of this I really echoes with what uh, Katie and Jerry talked about so you start with an authentic problem and um, the girl in the picture here her authentic problem was she needed to as a diplomat strengthen and expand her power using diplomacy so that is what diplomats do they gather intelligence they go to receptions they negotiate treaties. So these are all authentic uh, uh, problems and authentic tasks we're asking them to do. Um, the other piece, the next piece we, uh, we think is critical is the idea of need to know. So uh, if you do not know that the Ottomans and the Safavids are enemies, if you don't pay attention to that Safavid presentation and you're the Ottomans, you may end up negotiating a, a treaty that's not to your advantage. So everyone, there are no small parts, uh, only small actors in this. So we really have, uh, you, you need to pay attention because that person who maybe you don't interact with much otherwise, they may be your ally in getting a better uh, deal. So that's a really key piece. And then finally, differentiation. Um, you know, we have students of all backgrounds and all skill levels. So uh, there are students who, for, who will leave this project really knowing their own empire very well. Um, most of them, because they have to negotiate with another empire, will know two empires pretty well. Um, but some of the, the students who excel, uh, as Jerry mentioned earlier, they can begin to make connections all across. The idea of the enemy of my enemy is my friend and and pulling all these different pieces together 
Um, and there's really no upper limit. And one of the things, uh, Katie had mentioned that there's re they're revising the uh, AP uh, US Gov um, uh, exam. We, as we were doing this curriculum, they, they also uh, were changing the AP World History exam. And they've actually made it uh, broader so that you, you have many, you can pick the content you want to demonstrate a concept which really plays well into PBL because kids get to know a particular role. Uh, oftentimes in ours, they're, they're assigned to a region or a specific empire, and that doesn't penalize them when they take the test because as long as they can use the content and that understanding to answer uh, the question, to demonstrate a concept, that, uh, that helps them. So, um, uh, yeah, I think, I guess actually one last thing is that Jerry said he plays the role of coach, and uh, I also play the role of coach, but I also play the role as agitator and intrigue stirrer upper because the adding to that drama and saying, oh, you know, I heard that this empire is maybe, they might be uh, planning to uh, negotiate with someone else. Have you talked to the Dutch yet? Um, I'm pot stir to make that. <laughs> the drama's there, the kids will be engaged. And I might just add really quickly, having had the pleasure to work with Rob and see him present on what he's doing in AP World, I think that extending uh, this approach to the AP World history class is uh, possibly even more important than putting it in a government or civics class because it's more immediately obvious, I think, how to make government and politics relevant to kids. Uh, but world history, that's a little more of a lift. Um, and this is a way that it's authentic, engaging, and relevant. So, Yeah, that's one reason, uh, Walter here, one reason that we're eager to see uh, the knowledge and action approach extended to U.S. history courses as well. And, you know, we hear about that work getting off the ground in uh, various places. So that's exciting. We'll want to watch that. All right. That's uh, that's that's all for world history. Although, thanks, I, Rob. It was very fun. I think <laughs> um, so, everybody who's listening, um, we want to take a moment to reflect after hearing all this great information. Do you have one major takeaway that you're going to take with you? Um, we want to see your thinking. So, if you're willing to share, we'd love to see that thinking in the chat. Um, also, if you do have questions for our presenters. Um, you can type those in the questions box and we'll try to make sure that you get some answers. So Kefi, you want takeaways in the chat box and questions in the Q&A box. Is that right? That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, and I can just share out loud one of my major takeaways is Man, I really wish I had been in one of your classes. That sounds like so much fun. What an engaging way to learn just the larger relationships of power. That's so much better than sitting there and taking notes. Walter again, could I make a couple of comments while yeah. folks are considering questions and whatnot? The I wanted to tell everybody that the current issue of social education, which is the main social studies magazine in the country, the current issue features articles by the three teachers that you've heard from today. Rob has a good article on, and his uh, colleague Katie Smoot have a good article on the AP world they've developed. And uh, Katie Piper and Jerry Neufeld Kaiser have a good article on the AP Gov course that they've helped me develop. Um, I have an article generally on how to design an AP course using this model. Um, the design principles such as need to know that uh, Rob spoke in detail about. Um, so it's the January, February combined issue of social education. Those of you who are members have access to all, all the articles. Those of you who are not members have access to at least two of the articles. 
Um, so let me also mention that we're, we've not only scaled outward toward world history, but also to AP environmental science and currently to AP physics. So you can keep an eye on all of that work. Um, and the best way to keep an eye on it is through the George Lucas Education Foundation. Um, so that is who is going to be releasing our courses more broadly uh, using an online platform late this spring or summer, so you'll be able to access the projects. I know that Katie has been consulting them on um, keeping it teacher-friendly and uh, so keep an eye on that. We've this year been piloting the work in Chicago high schools and Boston high schools and Los Angeles, um, Charlotte Mecklenburg on the East Coast, Des Moines, Iowa in the middle of the country. Um, so there's we've been, we've been doing a lot of piloting trying to get some of the kinks out. So we encourage you to uh, keep an eye on the project and uh, we hope to see you gradually picking up projects, introducing them into your curriculum. That's all. Um, that sounds like such a great opportunity moving forward. Awesome. Jeffy, if, if yeah. I can just add something. Um, mm -hmm. If teachers are interested in uh, a PDL uh, world history curriculum, uh, my colleague and I wrote a curriculum planning and pacing guide that's available at the uh, College Board website. If you uh, Google CPPG uh, World History uh, and PDL, it, it'll come up. And it's just a framework for thinking about how you might uh, set up a, a, a PDL course for AP World History. Oh, that's really awesome. What a cool resource. Of course, one of the reasons that we're eager to share this work is that we, we're currently seeing a trend across the country where school superintendents are lowering the threshold for entry into AP courses. Um, and in Rob and Katie's district, Bellevue, they had a superintendent who was famous for not only lowering the tr threshold, but requiring students to take some number of AP courses. So as that trend spreads across the country, we want to make sure that kids not only enroll in AP courses, but are successful in them and enjoy them. Hence our emphasis on experiential learning, on role playing, on enjoyment, while not sacrificing pass rates on the AP test. And in fact, uh, at Sammamish High School for the past several years, there's been no non-AP option for seniors in terms of government and politics. So they have to either take AP US government or AP comparative government. So we have a lot of really non-traditional non quote unquote AP students in the course. And it simply would not work without simulations to draw them in. Um, and it still is challenging, uh, admittedly, uh, but I think that having a way to engage um, all kinds of students who look all different, uh, like all types of students, um, is, is kind of a powerful thing um, as these students are turning 18 and, and sort of making their way out in the world and getting ready to exercise their own civic voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, Katie. Thanks for that. And that uh, very much is happening across the country with... Uh, students being required to take AP Human Geography or AP Gov or AP World. Um, one thing we're finding is that the simulations-based approach helps students do more reading rather than less. And it has to do with the need to know principle that Rob spoke about. Um, students tell us in interviews that when we ask, so did you read the textbook? And they'll make comments like, well, of course I did. I didn't want to look like a fool the next day in the floor debate. So the, the performance anxiety that they feel knowing that they're going to play a role as a justice or an attorney or an, a representative from an empire uh, motivates them to do the homework reading. Um, so we're very interested in more rather than less reading. We don't mean for project-based learning to be a substitute for reading and writing. Rather, it's a framework to incorporate 
and create a need for the reading and the writing. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I'm not seeing any questions out there or anything in the chat. Um, so I guess we're going to move on. Um, I did want to share with you, um, Cheryl Coe is our um, social studies person at OSPI, and she's put together this really great website, and it has so many resources that you can use to help you get started on these cool things. So if you want to learn more, they are there and available to you all the time. Um, we do have a program evaluation, so before you go, please take a moment to give us an idea of how we're doing. If the webinar closes out, this link is always available to you in our Zoom reminders, so you can always check those through your email. Um, we appreciate our audience, and we really want to make this a good experience for you. And we're starting to plan our next year's offerings for the webinar, so if there are things that you really want to see, we really want to get that feedback from you and we'll try to build our show around those needs. Um, next month, uh, we're going to take a look at Tools for Schools. We'll be looking at the new Washington School Improvement Framework data, um, and so that includes attendance, ninth grade, and dual credit tools from OSPI. Um, so as people are starting to get into that implementation of the new ESSA, that's the Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, this will be a great support for learning about those tools as well. Um, we do have some upcoming events, so um, if you're interested in mental health in the high school training, that's coming up. Um, I can't recommend it enough, so if you're tackling school culture, it's a really great resource. Project AWARE um, brings this um, to you completely free and the curriculum helps improve mental health literacy and it's widely taught internationally. Um, so also keep an eye out for there's some upcoming uh, Counselor Summer Institute happening. So uh, those registration links aren't up yet, but stay tuned, they're coming. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us today and thank you our presenters for being a part of our show. Um, we do think this will be a great resource for our teachers and our schools out there. And Kefi, people can share this uh, URL with others and it's it's posted on your website, right? Yes, it is. It should Good. be on the Gate webinar page and so we should have captions up for it in the next couple of weeks and um, it'll be a video and the presentation's already there so if you do want to share that with other people you know, it's already available. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for joining us, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.